These are my disclosures. This is an old slide where we really show what has happened. And if you look at the immunotherapy over the years, the only thing which has really been licensed is PEG and Tefiram. Uh, and the only antivirals that have been licensed are nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. So there's not a lot of diversity at all in what we have been doing over the last decades. And, and it's very good that we see change now. So the question is what can be considered as cure? I don't want to go into that too deeply because uh, Fabienne already um, mentioned that uh, very nicely. Um, but I think the consensus really now is to go to functional cure. I don't know exactly what partial cure is, which might be important for particularly development of drugs. Um, but uh, most people think that HPS antigen loss is what we should aim for. So the, the treatment paradigm is really changing from an indefinite therapy with poor off-treatment response to a finite duration of treatment um, where really these nasty endpoints that we don't want to have, like liver cancer and liver cirrhosis and liver-related death, are prevented. So the, the, last year, like a year ago, we had a very interesting discussion. There was a group of virologists and a group of immunologists in the room, and at the roundtable discussion, it went back and forth what is the role of both? And there's, there's something to say for both. Uh, would, you, would be the virological approach enough? And even within companies, there are virologists say, well, we, I don't know if we need immunologists at all. Because um, the virologists say that blocking viral replication at multiple steps might, el and, uh, might eventually eliminate CCCD and eventually cure HBV infection. There will be no infected hepatocytes left. It's very debatable if that's true. It would be important, though, that we need better assays to really detect a very low level of replication, um, which we don't have in our hands now. And the other things that is mentioned is that once you decrease the viral load or the, or, or the protein load, that by itself might mount an immune response, which would not need any immunological treatment. And there's some examples of that. There's modification of antiviral therapy, uh, leading to an effective immune response. That, for an example, stopping treatment, I'll show you in a minute, and also long-term treatment. We know that long-term treatment, that people do get S antigen loss, not at a very high extent with, with, with uh, antivirals, but if you stop the antivirals, it's sustainable in the vast majority of the patients. Then on the other side, you have the immunologist. The virus integrates. It's very difficult to get rid of CCC DNA. Fabienne mentioned that very clearly. Um, and the proof is obviously that even patients who have S antigen loss or seroconversion, once you give them uh, like profound immune suppression, they will relapse. And they will even relapse with an S seroreversion. So that is, um, and we've seen that in, 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 in many cases. And we do have effective immune control uh, by giving uh, back interferon, although it's in a limited proportion of patients. Here's an example of what stopping therapy could do from uh, Thomas Berg, who did the first randomized study on this. Other studies are ongoing. And in the vast majority, you have a relapse of HPV DNA. Uh, but if you're courageous enough not to reinitiate treatment very quickly, you have patients in there, not many, but part, well, I mean, uh, let's say 10, 20% of your patients, where you do see an S antigen decline and even an S antigen loss. Because here you see on the left side uh, the patients who stopped treatment uh, and the amount of S antigen reduction, and on the right side patients who continued tenofovir treatment where there was virtually no S antigen loss or reduction, and it was the case in patients who stopped therapy. So this is just by mod modifying nuke therapy. So theoretically, obviously, it's a very attractive option to combine the two. The agents are complementary to each other. Uh, HBV uh, impairs innate and adaptive immunity, and if you lower the viral replication and protein load, as I mentioned, that might by itself enhance an immune uh, response. Uh, and the question is whether immunotherapy, and this is what many people think currently, might tip the balance towards a cure, a functional cure of hepatitis B. The problem with immunotherapy is that it, ha it might have a smaller therapeutic window. You have to be very careful on how to dose these agents, because if you underdose it, you won't have any effect. 
But if you overdose it, you could get cytokine storms and all kinds of nasty side effects that we don't want to have, particularly in these hepatitis B patients with very good treatments in our hands. Because remember, it's, it's very different to hepatitis C, where we had a lot of back-to-the-wall patients, and hepatitis B patients have a good therapy, and we have to uh, uh, give them a better therapy, but without uh, any, any side effects, really. And then there's a heterogeneous response, um, uh, which is very often seen, I would say, more so with host-targeting therapy than with virus-targeting therapy. So there's a lot of different options. Um, and there is also a treatment naive population as well as a huge warehouse of patients who are already uh, suppressed, who are on antivirals for a long time and they might want to be cured. And if you compare the two populations, they're, they're different. So the, the treatment naive population is typically younger, have active disease, HBV DNA can be used as a biomarker, there's no resistance. Uh, and it, they might be more likely to accept finite treatment. Then we have the suppressed population uh, who are already on an effective and a safe treatment. Uh, they might have a partial immune restoration which might help immune modifying therapy. They're potentially better protected against flares, but they also might have more objections to accept experimental therapy, particularly if they're a bit elder and they, they take uh, their antivirals and they think one pill a day will keep uh, the hepatitis away. So, so it's really uh, sometimes challenging to uh, enroll these patients into studies. Well, these are all the different uh, targets that we have and we'll hear a lot about that this afternoon. I'll come back to some of that in the rest of my talk. Because I thought, how can I answer this question? And I said, well, let's, if you don't know how to answer a question in science, you just try to go back to the data which are there um, and as a clinician, I would like to look particularly in clinical data because so there's a lot of work done uh, in the lab and in animal models, but that, that doesn't always or very often does not translate into uh, results that we have in clinics. So I looked at the different clinical trials which gave both antivirals and immune activators, both on licensed as well as on uh, new therapies. And if you look at one of the studies which was done, it's highly cited, most of you will have seen this before, is combining tenofovir and pacentefiron um, versus uh, tenofovir alone and versus pacentefiron alone. Um, and the authors of this paper were uh, pretty excited that the combination did do better than the monotherapy. But if you look at the, at the actual difference, it's very, very limited. This is, I think, 9% uh, uh, here with the combination and uh, nothing with tenofovir alone, and then the combination arms or the pec interferon only arm and the short-term combination are kind of in between. And also what was interesting is that they did see S antigen zero reversions in this particular study. Um, and um, um, Fabian just showed the, the, the sustainability of S loss in here. So yes, there is a bit of a better um, response in the combination, but it's not something that we would start massively practicing and giving our patients to not for impact interferon. The, the benefit is just too small, really. Um, then another strategy where, uh, um, where a lot of people are working on is to first decline the viral load, as I mentioned, to get rid of T cell exhaustion. And if you do that long enough uh, and then come in with an immune modulator, uh, where you might, might be more effective. So this is what we did in this particular study where we gave entecavir for half a year and then, and we've also done it with longer treatment and then randomized patients in either pack interferon add-on or entecavir alone. Uh, and the result was that indeed in the combination arm we did see a higher response rate um, in uh, patients being treated with pack interferon and entecavir uh, versus entecavir alone. But again, the, the difference was very, very limited, not really uh, something to be very enthusiastic about. The interesting part of this study in particular, though, is that the quality of the response was interferon, so the sustainability of response seemed to be higher with PEC interferon than with uh, entecavir. So the, we had more patients who, off treatment, remained to a, in a response once they had had PEC interferon versus those who only were treated with um, and tech affairs. So that means that that might also be very relevant for future agents that a specific response for one drug might not be as sustainable as it is for another drug, really. So that is a very difficult point also when we're discussing endpoints. 
So what about novel compounds? What has been done to combine antivirals and uh, immune activators? And this is a study where capsid inhibitors, uh, formerly owned by Novira, now by Janssen, was combined with back interferon. Um, and again, if you look in the different um, categories here of patients, first on the top uh, panel you see HPV DNA, and then in the lower panel you see E antigen uh, decline. Um, you do see that once you combine it, uh, you get a better response. But again, the difference with PAC interferon alone is not, uh, is not mind-boggling, really. And the, and the problem here is that they saw a very negligible effect on S antigen, which you might not expect with this particular compound with the capsid modulators. Then there are the, uh, the, the pattern recognition receptors, the TLR agonists, uh, RIG-I, et cetera. Here a study uh, where we treated patients who were already on antivirals and added an immune modulator um, in different doses and different length of treatment. Um, and the drug was very well tolerated, but the effect was limited, close to zero really. So um, there was definitely an effect on in interference stimulating genes. However, it was disappointing to see that we didn't see any S decline in these particular patients. Same holds truth of therapeutic vaccination. We've been working on therapeutic vaccination for decades. Almost all of these studies are unfortunately negative, um, and every time we come in with a new vector or uh, new peptides, um, and, um, um, and it, it is an interesting concept. It is, however, very challenging for people who have had this disinfection with their viral load, with a huge load of proteins for decades, to, to tip the immune balance uh, just with the vaccine. Anyway, so what we did here is we had an tenofovir only group, and we had this uh, GS4774 uh, vaccine with the yeast-based vaccines called Tarmogen, packed with different epitopes. Uh, we gave different doses uh, of the vaccine in combination with uh, tenofovir uh, and tenofovir alone. And it looked pretty promising here at week uh, 24 if we looked at HBS antigen decline uh, from baseline. The treatment was given for 24 weeks uh, with, a, with, a, with a better response rate in the groups who were treated with the vaccine. However, off treatment, um, uh, so only the last 24 weeks, only tenofovir was given. The, the responses really leveled out. And unfortunately, we didn't see a lot of effect of this vaccine either. Um, then, just as a last example, um, <clears throat> we have the checkpoint inhibitors of PD-1, PD-L1 inhibition can reverse immune uh, can exhaustion of HPV-specific T cells. This is done. Uh, this is work done in, in, in Germany from Rockendorf's group, where he really combined in an animal model, in a woodchuck model, uh, and tecavir together with the DNA vaccine and together with an anti-PD-1 uh, PD-L1 antibody, and there seemed to be. Um, an additional effect of combining these three, if you look at this blue curve, which contains all of the three components where you would have the best effect. Then again, this was also done in humans in a different setting, obviously, um, where a therapeutic vaccine was given together with nucleoside analogs and an anti-PD-1 uh, antibody. Uh, and this was done with nivolumab in a, in a low dose, uh, I would say three, uh, actually two different doses. So uh, one group was given nivolumab uh, alone um, and in 0.1 milligram, then there is 0.3 milligrams in between. Um, and the, the third group got the vaccine that I've just mentioned you about. And the end point was 16 weeks um, after, uh, uh, after treatment, really. Um, and if you look at this combination of, uh, again, antivirals and um, immune modifying agents, again, there's a very modest uh, response overall. Um, and if you combine the group of, uh, actually, nivolumab uh, together with the vaccines, actually two immune modifying agents, it's not really better than nivolumab uh, alone. So there is very limited evidence yet that um, we need immune modifiers, but then again, the antivirals are also not sufficient enough to give us uh, the answer to functional cure. 
So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, targeting the virus, I think the therapies uh, targeting HPV directly are effective and welcome in many flavors and interfering different steps of the replication cycle. And change in the viral load has been shown in the minority of patients to induce functional cure with S loss, either by long-term nucleoside analog therapy or by stopping therapy. With targeting the immune system, we're making very small steps, and we just are at the begin of the road. So don't be in despair. I mean, we started with hepatitis C with 5% response, and we eventually got there. Um, and um, But the first responses to antivirals, at least in the clinic, uh, have been negative or very modest. And it's also a reason that we started very slowly and very carefully not to induce too many side effects. Was the, 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 again, the therapeutic window is small. There is a heterogeneous response. And I do think we have a long way uh, with immune modulators to go and combination therapy is most likely needed. <clears throat> so to come back to my question, are immune modulators really needed to cure HPV infection? The answer is I really don't know. <laughs> um, and I, I do think that a lot of companies also don't know because they're investing in both and they're combining treatments. Uh, I would say probably yes, we might need these immune modulators over time because we have no functional cure with the approach targeting the virus thus far. And I personally doubt whether we will ever will. A slight problem is that we have not found the right immune modulator really thus far, and it will, be very, it will be far from easy to find this. So hopefully next year um, we'll have the answer to it all. So today we're discussing this, but I really would like to uh, invite you to come back in June 2018 at the Global Hepatitis Summit here in Toronto. You have the flyers uh, on top of your desks, so don't throw them away like you usually do, but use them <laughs> uh, and, and submit an abstract, I would say, because we do have, uh, I would say, an outstanding faculty, both from a basic science perspective as well as from a clinical perspective. Thank you very much.